baptize bar heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful opportunity, this magnificent time that you've set aside for each one of us as individuals as well as a family. Thank you for freedom that continues to set us free, Father, and thank you for all the nice reminders that you've been giving us from the pulpit, uh, the perspective that you give us by means of your spirit and his ministry in our lives, and of course for the completed canon, the word of God. Father, we pray for those that are ill in the congregation that can't be with us, but desire to be here. That we just want them to know that we're praying for them and that they be encouraged knowing that they are witnessing to all of us as they continue uh, to trudge on no matter what. And so, Father, we are grateful for them, but we also want them to know that we love them and we want them back. Your will be done, of course. We pray also for those that are still lost in this world, uh, that they might be humbled before it's too late, be uh, repentant and saved. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make an evening like this one a reality. May we never become familiar with it. We just ask for your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Um, just for a big picture perspective, I said this uh, at the start of class, that um, this series that we're going to embark on uh, really draws from the previous um, two months of lessons. And just so you know, this is what it's looked like. Here's our curriculum in April and May of this year. Uh, what is repentance and who gets to define it? That was the tail end of that. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Then we talked about the power of deception. And then are you ready was a question that uh, the Spirit took, put on the table for us. And then, of course, we just finished up three lessons on why all the complexity in chaos and uh, tonight's lesson is titled the peaceful fruit of righteousness so just take a step back always and and uh, look at the curriculum itself and really appreciate the the way and the timing of the spirit and his lessons to all of us so tonight's lesson is titled the peaceful fruit of righteousness which really is uh, the opposite of uh, why all the complexity and chaos uh, of course, as you know, this is a ripoff um, from Holy Scripture that came from the Spirit on Tuesday evening, this phrase, the peaceful root of righteousness. But before we dig our heels into this concept, let's ponder a few things. And I need you to concentrate tonight uh, because there's a whole message perspective uh, in connecting the dots that is required. So you're going to have to concentrate the entire night. I know it's Thursday evening and it's probably the least likely time you're going to do it um, because you're probably getting towards the end of your gas tank for the week in terms of work, but I really need you to concentrate and pull in uh, all that you remember from these uh, lessons of old of the last couple of months uh, into this evening. So let's start with something basic uh, up here on the board. 1 John 5, 17, just part A. All unrighteousness is sin. When it's that clearly stated, we know that that's an absolute truth. All unrighteousness is sin. So we need to put this into perspective, given all that the Spirit's given us over the past couple of months. And if we knit all that we've seen in Holy Scripture together so that it points to this evening's message title, we might endeavor to knit it this way. And this is going to be a recurring slide this evening. Unrighteousness equals sin, we just saw that, which equals discord, uh, which is um, a synonym for lack of peace. It's the opposite of peace. So unrighteousness equals sin equals discord. We know that, um, and we all agreed over the past few lessons, that sin is the great destructor of peace and love even. So unrighteousness equals sin equals discord or lack of peace. What we've learned is that peace 
is the result of our Lord's promise to give it. He said, my peace I leave with you, John 14, 27. However, it's a wonderful promise. However, we've also learned that such promises are conditioned experientially upon our obedience. Again, we have peace available to us. Not that peace is not available to us, but it is a function. It's conditioned experientially upon our obedience. And that's why people who lack peace, who are believers, are also disobedient in some way, shape, or form. And that's what the Spirit's been pointing out. So Psalm 112.1, Proverbs 16.7, John 13.17, James 1.25, 2 John 1. Six. Go to Psalm 112, verse 1. Again, we've also learned that such promises are conditioned upon our obedience. Psalm 112, verse 1. And God is not shy about this. That's the weirdest thing about modern Christianity. It's almost like uh, people are afraid to be, I don't know, legalistic or religious or something like that. Uh, it's perfectly legitimate to echo God's sentiments on obedience and who receives his promises of peace, etc. Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man... That's it? No. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Who fears the Lord. When you fear someone, you what? Obey them. Who greatly delights in what? His commandments. That is the same thing as saying the person who obeys his commandments. Again, how blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Is peace a blessing? You bet. Well, there you have it. Peace goes to the one who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. How about Proverbs 16, 7. Proverbs 16, verse 7. <clears throat> We're not going to leave peace this evening. Peace is right there. And that's why I said, take it with you from our previous lessons and even our lesson title this evening, The Peaceful Fruit of Righteousness. Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord... He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Go to James 1.25. James 1.25. We're just trying to establish the second sentence, the second principle, if you would, on the board that, we, uh, that God's promise of peace is conditional upon obedience James 1.25. James 1.25, But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. The law of liberty, an effectual doer, this person is blessed. Go to 2 John verse 6. 2 John 6. It's right after 1 John. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. <laughs> 2 John 6. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Okay, is it fair to say that that's an established principle, the point on the board? The second point especially, we've also learned that such promises are conditioned experientially on our obedience, of course. Of course. Now, I withheld uh, one more verse for the sake of perspective, now that we've seen what the Bible has to say about unrighteousness equals sin equals discord or lack of peace. What the Spirit's trying to establish in your soul is a string of connective tissue between the love that flows from God Himself to the resultant peace. And that's how, if we get there, 
we're going to end this evening's message on results. God is a God of results. His words are not vapid. Uh, they're not void of substance. If he says it, it happens. That's why even it says, by the word of God, these things happen. So he's just trying to create some connective tissue between the love that flows forth from the wellspring of it, which is God, to the resultant peace we might have in our souls. If at any point, though, in the chain of events called life, that string, if you would, that connective tissue is severed, to whatever degree it is severed, we suffer the loss of peace, exchanging it for the antithesis of peace. Things like complexity and chaos, as we've learned. And that's all he's trying to establish. A, a, a root or a, 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 some connective tissue back to the root cause of all things good. And when we deviate, if you would, from the root cause of all things good, it makes sense that the conditions of his promises begin to wane. Uh, not that he's not able, but rather that we are choosing that route. So I was thinking of an analogy. It's, it's, a, it's not a bad analogy, so just bear with it. I'm just trying to drive a point home. Suppose you plant a flower seed right up against a bed of roots and weeds. You live in a sunny place, so the flower does manage to grow. However, it is choked out by the nature of the soil you planted it in. It's already busy. There's already competition for nutrients, sun, etc., while a flower is designed to flourish and reveal God's hand in beauty, it isn't designed to fight for its existence the same way, say, a weed does, which is why a weed usually wins. Because a weed is a scrappy fighter and it's going to beat the flower out. However, give a flower the right environment and it will become something magnificent that you and others can enjoy day after day. Deprive it of what it needs, and it will either stunt or maybe not grow at all. So you resolve to fix the struggling flower issue. You see your flower struggling to grow over where you planted it, so you take the initiative to transplant it to a better spot. And lo and behold, it flourishes wonderfully. This is the same thing God does when he sanctifies you. It's the same. He, he makes the soil even around you richer, firmer, more conducive to growth. And he waters you with the word by means of the spirit. And so this is how he sanctifies you. He may even pluck you out of a situation and say that situation that you're in, dysfunction junction, is no longer where I want you to be. You've learned your lesson. Let's go. And he may transplant you and say, I don't want you there anymore. I need you over here now. The strange thing is that some of you remain in soil that is antagonistic to sanctification itself, and you do so willingly. And that's the key operative phrase, because didn't we just begin class with peace is a function, is dependent, is conditioned on obedience to God? We just talked about that. So if you're dragging your feet and you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, James says it's a sin. Because if it's not right, then it's unrighteous, right? And we just saw that all unrighteousness is what? Sin. We just saw that. And so you're now being antagonistic to God himself, the one who's trying to bless you out, as we just saw in a few wisdom passages. And so the strange thing is that some of you remain in soil that is antagonistic to sanctification itself, and you do so willingly. You might be saying, well, you know, that sounds good philosophically speaking, but what does that mean practically? I mean, come on, I'm, I'm waxing poetic about a flower. I mean, you know, it sounds great on paper. It sounds good philosophically, but what does it mean practically? So that is a question that only God can answer in your life. I'm always available. If you want, look, no one ever takes me up on it. It's rare, maybe twice a year. If you really want good, objective counsel, I'm here to talk to you. Part of my job. 
It's part of a shepherd's job. I'm convinced of it. Very few people take me up on the offer, maybe because they don't want to hear it. Maybe you don't want to hear the truth. Isn't that what it is? You'd rather call your friend on the phone. <laughs> Back in this function. It's okay, baby. It's okay. Right? Yeah, I know. So I don't get ever, I never get calls. <laughs> Either that or you don't, none of you trust me. So it's one or the other. Anyways. As far as what this means to you practically, that's a question that only God can answer in your life. But I can help you begin thinking about areas that seem to be at least common among Americans. For example, and I just brainstormed, and I'm sure you could come up with a hundred of your own, but these are ones that the Spirit ordained for this lesson. So ask yourself these questions. What is your first priority when... You think of money. Okay, instead of waxing poetic, you know, instead of, oh, the pretty flower, I'm a pretty flower, and I'm growing, <laughs> and God's sanctifying me, and look at my, oh, look at my rosebuds, and I'm such a pretty girl, and such a handsome guy, and oh, you know, okay, enough. What does it actually mean in your life? How does he sanctify you? You can tell a lot about your so-called spiritual maturity when you talk about your priorities. What is a priority in your life? There are people right now, perfect example, people right now should be here and they're not. Why? Because it's not a priority. No matter what they say, no matter what they do, God knows it's not a priority. I don't know who exactly it is, but it's got to be at least one person. So what is your first priority when you think of money? Maybe even ask who. What is your first priority when you engage with media? So you go home, you flick on the TV. What's your priority? To learn more about God or to be lazy? To take in septic pipe stuff? I'm serious. Like, what is your priority when you sit down in front of the Internet? Or your little smartphone? What is your priority? It's a fair question. Those are the questions we have to ask ourselves. What is your first priority when you build relationships? Are you looking to build godly relationships or ungodly ones? Are you, to, are you looking to build relationship, stronger relationships with the world and agents of Satan himself in the kingdom of darkness? Or are you looking to build relationships with godly people? What is your first priority when you have some free time? Booyah! Or are you looking to the word of God? Are you saying, finally, I can, I don't know, reflect on that lesson or catch up on a lesson that I didn't catch? And then, of course, what is your first priority when you read your Bible, attend church, pray, etc.? Those are great questions. And they really are. If you read the Bible, those are all, they're all covered. Maybe not specifically like media, per se, because there really wasn't a whole lot of media back in the day. But these questions, especially money, relationships, and um, let's say religious practices, to just to include that last one, those are highly uh, tapped into in the Bible. And, and the Bible says, what's your first priority when it comes to these things? Because you can't serve, serve God and wealth, right? So says the Bible. You shouldn't be fellowshipping with ungodly people. So says the Bible. Pray without ceasing. Do not forsake assembling together. Read your Bible, so says the Bible. <laughs> you see? It's right there. And that's when you have to ask, what's your first priority when you do any of these things? I just got a raise. How many of you got a raise, and every single time you get a raise, you increase your giving to the church? Is that your first priority? Oh, I get to give more charitably? Or is it, oh, wow, I can go on more vacations? Me, 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 me. That's the type of things we have to think about. So these are the practical areas of our lives that we must ponder whenever we begin thinking about the soil we surround ourselves with. This is not a philosophy class where we sit and drink, you know, cafe lattes and pontificate over the virtues of living righteously. 
This is a very practical calling we have been called in this life um, up here on the board. We ought to live like Christ, not just talk like Him. Live like Him, not just talk like Him. Talk is cheap. So says James in the book after his name. He doesn't use that language, but that's exactly what he's saying. Talk is, talk is cheap. And he does that, James does that, on the sanctifying power of the Spirit and the Word in his hand. Think of it this way. The Word of God tills, waters, and fertilizes our soil. However, however, we have our hands on the plow. We might call that our free will in a more practical sense. See, some people take the other route, the extreme route, which says, well, I'm just, gonna let, I'm just gonna sit here like a couch potato and let God deliver me. No, you have your hands on the plow. That's a very practical place to be, isn't it? Behind the power system, behind the ox? And you're trying to cut a furrow in the ground? It's a very a uh, strategic place to be, is it not? Yeah. We call that our free will. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, up here on the board? Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. That's a, uh, a strong statement. Now, just so you know, Jesus was not speaking about entrance into the kingdom but rather service within it. This is not a salvation passage, strictly speaking. It's about servitude, service. And so you have the option as a hired servant, if you would, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he's master, we're slave. We have our, he says, put your hand, I, I saved you. Your hands are on the plow now. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? So if you're saved, your hands are already placed on said plow. Your fitness is a function of your sanctification. Your sanctification is a function of your faith. And your faith is a function of your humility and obedience to the word of Christ. Romans 10, 17. Your fitness is a function of your sanctification. Your sanctification is a function of your faith. Your faith is a function of your humility and obedience to the word of Christ. Not going to be a very good service, a service if you're constantly dropping the plow, or you're looking over here, and you're like looking over there. Oh, hey, sweetie. <laughs> right? And, the, you know, things start going over here, and then, you know, start cutting what they call crooked furrow. That's not very conducive to good farming. How often have you gone by Bristol Ag and you see all the lines going like this? A few students be getting the big old flunky. So back to the question being raised, it began with this principle. Unrighteousness equals sin equals discord slash lack of peace. What we've learned is that peace is the result of our Lord's promise to give it. My peace I leave with you. However, we've also learned that such promises are conditioned experientially upon our obedience. Our obedience. So when we address a fair question, what does all this mean practically? we must consider what we just established regarding obedience. I mean, at a philosophical level, we may talk about a flower growing in some soil, but the Spirit desires that we get a lot more practical than that. And it just is, isn't it fair to say that it's usually more comfortable to just talk philosophically? It's usually more comfortable just to talk about, you know, the pretty little flower, and I'm the flower, and isn't it awesome? And God comes along with his little watering can and, you know, <laughs> thank you, God. And what does that mean? Like, for real. What's your priority? He just watered you. And you're like, oh, thank you, God. Well, okay, that's good. Okay, that's good. I'm sustaining you. Your hands are on the plow. What are, you, what are we doing here? So just reflecting on that, 
what our curriculum over the past couple of months has led us uh, to is a simple perspective about the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Why does he have a guy like me up here saying these things to you, challenging you? Because there's peaceful fruit of righteousness, of being right before God, of being righteous in your service to him, of putting your hand in the plow and staying focused on the job at hand, obeying. A farmer doesn't tell you to look left and right and go cut crooked furrows, does he? He says, I'm putting you in charge of this thing. I want you to cut a straight one in the soil. When you do that, you have peace, knowing that you're obeying your master. And that's all he's trying to do, is set you free. We haven't even gotten to the passage that includes that powerful statement. And already we're knee-deep in self-reflection. I'm not surprised. Just a side note on this. Uh, this is really a side note, but I wanted to share it with you. And these are the kinds of thoughts that I, off, I have all day long about all of you. All day long about all of you. It's just my life. It's my burden, so to speak. One of the reasons I believe, as your pastor, that the Spirit hardly ever you know, lets us off the hook, doesn't just say, okay, that's great, you get the flower analogy. Whee! He never does that. It's because of our personal histories. I believe most of us in the past were quite adept at learning, but not so good at actually obeying the Word of God. We're really good learners, but not so good obeyers. I think for most of us, it had gotten so bad that we actually became terribly arrogant about our arrogance. Yep. We became terribly arrogant about our arrogance. As the late Charles Spurgeon once stated, we needed to repent from our so-called repentance because our repentance lacked true faith. Up here on the board. I learn from the scriptures that repentance is just as necessary to salvation as faith is. And the faith that has not repentance going with it will have to be repented of. And so just sharing that, again, I'm just sharing insight as a little sidebar. Why does he never let this group off the hook? Because we're really good learners, but not very good obeyers, historically. And don't say I don't know you, because I know all of you well enough to know that's true. Remember the title of this evening's message is The Peaceful Fruit of Righteousness. The Peaceful Fruit of Righteousness as a function of something. What is it? Righteousness. Being right before God. That's what righteousness means. Hmm. The only way you're right before God is if you obey. And that goes with salvation at every phase. The Bible calls out salvation proper as obedience of faith. And then after you're saved, there's obedience. Hmm. And there's peaceful fruit of obedience, of being right before God. So as we've seen over the years, fruit is a practical device that God uses to prove to us that He is actually sanctifying us. That's what I love about it. I mean, I think that was one of the things when I was caught up in you know my own... I don't know what you want to call it. Self, I guess. Um, one of the things that always bugged me is that my own doctrine, my own theology lacked a certain substance, um, an ability to look in the mirror truthfully and see the fruit, not just academically. I'm a smart guy. I can see a lot of academic fruit that he's done in me. But I mean in my life. And so fruit is a practical device that God uses to prove to us that he is actually sanctifying us. For grace always bears fruit in the life of a believer. And while it's true that fruit, like the seed of a flower, isn't always evident at first, eventually it bears visible beauty. Eventually it always does. All right, let's recap. 
where we've been so far this evening. Up here on the board. Out of the gate, we had 1 John 5, 17a. All unrighteousness is sin when you're not right with God, when you're disobedient to God. It's a sin. This is in perfect accord with our lesson title, of course, since sin destroys peace and righteousness produces it. And our subject is the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Sin destroys peace, righteousness produces it. The second principle that keeps coming back is unrighteousness equals sin equals discord or lack of peace. What we've learned is that peace is the result of the Lord's promise to give it. My peace I leave with you. However, we've also learned that such promises are conditioned experientially upon our obedience. That's what we just went through as an exercise. What we conclude here is that sin is tantamount to disobedience. Remember the base definition of sin? To miss the mark. God says, I want you right here. <laughs> and you say, oh, I want to be right here. And the really arrogant one says, I want to be way over here. And to whatever degree you move away from the sphere of God's love and peace and all that stuff, you lack. The longer you run away from him, the more the conditioned promises begin to wane. You want to lack peace? Run away from God. Seriously. You want to lack peace? Stop reading your Bible. I don't know about you, but I say to myself all the time, I'm a walking experiment. There are days, plural, yeah, I know, it's shameful, where I don't actually open up my Bible and just for the sake of reading a passage, I don't read a passage. And I suffer. And I start getting like, you know, like, I haven't taken a shower like in like a week. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not that that's not normal, but... <laughs> like, you know that feeling you get like... You know what I'm saying? You come, you go to like the beach where it's salt water and you get that crusty feeling. You got suntan and sand stuck to it. That's what it feels like if I don't read my Bible for a few days. And in my, I'm agitated. And I'm losing my peace. And, and I'm saying, and in the moment sometimes I don't think about it. I'm like, why am I so like irritable? And then I figure out, you haven't been reading your Bible. Or you haven't been praying enough. You haven't been with them. You haven't been fellowshipping with them. The way you ought to. And I go, oh, right? Duh. <laughs> Anyways. What we conclude is that sin is tantamount to disobedience. The third key principle is to live like the one who never disobeyed, up here on the board, who always had peace. We ought to live like Christ, not just talk like Him. And then finally, we rest on Jesus' own words about servitude. This is really practical. Luke 9, 62, But Jesus said to him, No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So, just a little bit more on that last piece. It's true, we've been given a grip on a plow, our own lives, that is. That's the practical side of this evening's message. We're talking about our own lives as individuals. And since the sin in us still yields some power over us, we may cut a crooked furrow in the soil that surrounds us. And that is the imagery here that the Spirit's putting before us. He says, imagine yourself on a plot. And God says, hold on to this plot. And I don't want you looking left and right. Because if you look left and right, you're going to become what? Disoriented. I want you to look straight ahead so that you cut a straight furrow. That's the imagery. And I was thinking about that. If we look behind us whenever we see a variation from the straight line, living that is obedience to Christ, we know those were the times we sinned. If we were to look around, in other words, I mean, some of us would be like, oh my word. Right? Because it would be like... Hopefully it would be what a physicist would call a dampening sine wave. <laughs> All that means is it just gets less and less. You just kind of go, ooh. Nobody? All right. If we look behind us, we 
see something. And in knowledge of Holy Scripture, we realize that that's when we strayed, when we were disobedient. Have you ever noticed that if you are driving a vehicle and you drop something and you go to pick it up off the floor, you almost invariably swerve to the side, sometimes dangerously? Ooh, that's bad. But didn't you think while you were doing this that you were just going to be the like Mario Andretti, like, right? You're going to, you know, almost invariably, you're like, whoa! Didn't even notice. Hmm. Even though in your mind's eye, you're doing a good jo job at staying between the lines. One of the first things they teach you in instrument pilot training is to never, and I'm talking, now I want to talk, I want to open this up to all you emotional people out there. Men and women alike, okay? All you that think God is about emotions, it's how you feel. One of the first things they teach you in instrument pilot training is to never trust your feelings, but rather your instruments. Never trust your feelings. Always your instruments. And they prove this to you. I think I told you this story years ago. But they prove this to you by putting a hood on you, like this. And then they, the instructor would go like this. And do all kinds of goofy maneuvers, right? And they say, before you look up, what's your attitude? Attitude just means relative to the horizon. This would be banked, right? You know, like this. This is your attitude. What's your attitude? And you're like, oh, it's totally up. And you look and you're like, whoa! And, they, and then he plucks the uh, suction cup thing over the attitude indicator. He says, look. And you're literally like this. But if you were to go by kinesthetics, what your body feels, the seat, that's why they call it flying by the seat of your pants. If you go by the seat of your pants, you think you're going up like this because all you feel is G's, you know? You're like, whoa! In my case, it's a lot of G's. It doesn't make any sense if you know physics. So. <laughs> Guys, like, oh yeah, because you're so. Don't work that way, smarty pants. But anyways, you feel a lot of G's, right? And you swear your feelings are correct, right? But I feel this way. It's a trick, because when you look up, you can't believe how wrong your feelings were. The spiritual life is a lot like flying instruments. Unfortunately, most Christians still fly by their feelings, by the seat of their pants. And this is supremely dangerous. When our hands are on the plow, it's not about how we feel. Listen. When our hands are on the plow, it's not about how we feel, but rather how oriented to truth we are. And if we are disoriented, we veer offline and cut a crooked furrow. And that's where your fitness comes into question. Your servitude comes into question. When our hands are on the plow, it's not how we feel, but rather how we are oriented to truth. And those are the times that we run into soil that isn't ripe for planting the truth. When we go off, when we disorient, when we say, oh, but it feels good. It feels like God wants me to do this thing. Are you sure? Because the Bible says, no way. But I feel in love. <laughs> uh, it feels right. Yeah, I'm sorry. What's the Bible have to say about these emotions that you have that are guiding you nonetheless? Do you think there's a reason why there's certain suffering in your life? Do you think maybe, just maybe, God doesn't lie when He says, I'm not going to be mocked? If you're going to run the ship, if you're going to put your hands on a plow like an emotional basket case, and you're going to go like this, because you know emotionalism is about as unstable as it comes. <laughs> Right? If you really think this is what I want for you, you've got another thing coming. 
Because when you're over here, then you're going to suffer. And when you're over there, you're going to suffer. And you're going to go back over there, and you're going to suffer, and you're going to suffer again. But you won't ever, you know, you'll be like, oh, but this is the cross that I bear. No, 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 no. You're running amok. That's not a cross you're bearing. That's called stupidity. That's called emotionalism. There's a reason why you keep suffering. It's because you think feelings rule the day. Always remember the instrument flying analogy. It's about what the instruments say. This is your instrument cluster. Open it up. There's your attitude indicator. All right? This is your altimeter over here. This is what you trust, not what you feel. So there are times we run into soil that isn't right for planting the truth when we veer around and it ends up being antagonistic to it even. So now's a good time to revisit our previous thought-provoking list of practical questions. And this time with a little more perspective, I think, think about each line item very practically and deliberately and don't wimp out. Don't wimp out. What's your first priority when you think of money? Oh, but it feet stop. What is your first priority when you think about money? Is it in accordance with God? Right here. Not what the world says about he who dies with the most toys wins. Not that garbage. Not that trap. What does this say about money? Last time I checked, it's the root of all, the love of it's the root of all kinds of evil. You can't serve mammon and God. What's your first priority when you engage with media? If there is one sewer pipe that I wish personally I could get rid of in this world, it would be media. Every form of it. Don't even tell me the news, because the news isn't even, I don't even know. Donald Trump's right, it's fake. It's not even news anymore, it's sensationalism. Everybody's a prostitute. So what are you going to learn? Seriously, what are you looking to learn when you turn on the television? Even, even, anyway, it doesn't matter. What's your first priority when you build relationships? I'm serious. What's your first? Scott, I'm serious. Scott gets a kick when I say that. He's like, are you serious? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> right? <laughs> your, what's your first priority when you build relationships? Who are you looking to build relationships with? Is it for emotional reasons? But they make me feel good. That's because they lie to you. Dum dum. They lie to you. They say, yeah, McDonald's food is totally healthy. That's a lie. What's your first priority when you have some free time? That's a big one for a lot of people. And what's your first priority when you read your Bible, attend church, and pray? So while you're thinking about that, let me begin redirecting your attention now to the positive side of this equation, namely righteousness and its fruit. And of particular concern, peace. What about this uh, peaceful fruit of righteousness? As I mentioned at the start of class, the Spirit is trying to create a string of connective tissue between the love that flows forth from God Himself to the resultant peace we have in our souls. Because the Bible says, if you love Him, you obey Him. If you fear him, you obey him. If you obey him, you get his blessings. You get his conditional promises, you see. This love is exemplified to we individuals upon the basic fact that God has loved us enough to save us. I don't know about you, but that is the anchor to any peace that I have. I know he loved me enough to save me. That alone gives me a massive amount of peace in my soul. Just knowing that he's loved me enough, he proved to me that he loved me enough to become a man, to die in my stead. That gives me a lot of resultant peace. That was the sentiment of Paul at the end of his great epistle to the Romans. Go to Romans 16.25. Romans 16, 25. 
But Spirit's saying, let's be practical. Let's be practical. Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, so all this was planned in other words, has been made known to all the nations, that is the gospel even, leading to obedience of faith. That's salvation proper. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. So let's just dissect this a little bit more. Up here on the board. According to the commandment of the eternal God, this establishes God's will in salvation slash sanctification. That's what God wants. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save. This establishes God's will in salvation and sanctification. The gospel is the linchpin of all saving grace, before and after salvation, proper. The very existence of a believer is intrinsically bound to the gospel. Yeah. Point number two. Leading to obedience of faith, God's will leads some to salvation as a, a direct result of being obedient to the gospel command to believe, Romans 1.5. Obedience is always the way of salvation, sanctification, and righteousness. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds like a command to me. So you see, obedience starts right at salvation proper. It's fundamental to the gospel. And then we are to live in that gospel reality. Do you think the, um, the features of it change just because it's sanctification phase two, let's say? Do you think that God changes his mind about why he's going to bless you out? He saved you. That's awesome. How's he going to sanctify you? Obedience. But I'm suffering. I know. Obey. It's hot out here. <laughs> they look like they're having so much fun over And Satan's got like a mirage, you know. He's like, oh. Obey. In the face of persecution. In the face of your so-called difficult life. Bear your own cross. Pick it up and start walking. Put your hands on the plow. Go. God's will leads some to salvation as a direct result of being obedient to the gospel. Command to believe. And when I say some, I'm talking about not everybody is saved. Obedience is always the way of salvation, sanctification, and righteousness. And that's what he's trying to connect. He's saying there's a real result of obedience. It's called sanctification. So before we even get to our primary passage, and I'm almost out of time, we might conclude the following. Sorry about the eye chart. Peace from obedience. If we want peace, we must obey God's commands. That's a fact. Obedience implies very practical, practical, practical lifestyle choices, not just mental assent to obedience. Obedience, believe it or not, includes behavior. Now, you can get all crazy and be all philosophical and psychological and get into hyperanalysis of, well, but you know, because the behavior always is a function. Hey, I know. I know, but maybe the Bible's a little bit more practical than you, oh, wise one, oh, educated moron. Maybe it's that simple. Maybe instead of hyperanalyzing everything and trying to be a, a, a doctrinal giant, maybe I'll just read the Bible. And the Bible talks an awful lot about behavioral issues. Don't do this. Do this. Be a doer, not just the one who hears and deludes themselves. Do this. Do that. Okay. Sounds pretty darn practical to me. 
<laughs> if we want peace, we must obey God's commands. Obedience implies very practical lifestyle choices. Sean, a 17-year-old kid, said at the dinner table the other day, we always know what is right and wrong. Did you not say that? He's 17. Now, if a 17-year-old knows and is totally convicted that he knows right and wrong, somewhere his conscience says, that's right and that's wrong. Right? If a 17-year-old kid can say that, then everybody in here can say that. You know what's right and wrong. So it's really not hard to obey in a behavioral pattern, is it? Because you know exactly what's right from wrong. So don't blame it on some psychological babblecock. Is that a word? I think it is. Look it up. <laughs> Stop blaming it on some psychoanalysis you got in the third grade from a guidance counselor who wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ, let's say. It's not hard. It's not even meant to be hard. You know the right thing to do. Is that fair? You do. You know the right thing to do. When it really comes down to it, you know it's the right thing to do. At just about every single decision you ever make, you know the right thing to do. And you don't pick up the phone, historically, until you don't want to do the right thing. Hey, why don't you just be honest next time you call. Hey, can you convince me not to do the right thing, please? No, we, we masquerade the whole thing. <laughs> so mean to me. How, you know, what do you think? <laughs> it was so mean to me. What do you think? <laughs> oh, you're my best friend now. <laughs> Two idiots flying by the seats of their pants. This is what you need. And you already know. Anyways, I'm just poking fun at this point. If we want peace, we must obey God's commands. Obedience implies very practical lifestyle choices, not just mental assent to obedience. While we can't, you know, fake it till we make it, I mean, because God sees the heart, we can at least humble ourselves, learning humility through life itself. I mean, that's how God sanctifies us, as we've been learning. God gives faith, Romans 12, 3, that leads to obedience, that leads to peace. But if we're going to be ornery, disobedient jackasses, I'm going to go on a limb here and say we need to go back and read part of Romans 6. This is uh, uh, practice righteousness. Be a slave of righteousness, not unrighteousness. Is that, is that rocket science? Not really. Because righteousness has the word right in it, correct? Which implies you know the difference between right and wrong. Which implies you have what? A conscience. Which implies that God has given everyone a conscience. Is that true? Yes, it is. Absolutely it is. So we know. We know what obedience is at every turn. And this is what he's telling us. He's saying, listen, if you want to be disobedient, you're going to miss out. If you obey, I'm going to give you peace. Remember the peace? That I said I'd give you, remember that? I leave you my peace, the, the perfect one who perfectly obeyed at all times. You know, perfect obedience, perfect peace. Maybe he's on to something. I'm going to give you that, but you've got to obey. But it doesn't feel right. So? So? What do you mean it doesn't feel right? By what? By God's, by the world's standards? It's never going to feel right if you watch Hollywood. Hollywood is literally the antithesis. If you get your love potions from movies, you have a huge problem. I almost wrote a blog. And I, I don't know. I'm kind of, it's like, kind of like a spoiler alert. But um, I almost wrote the blog because I write the blog now on Wednesdays. Or oh, Thursdays, excuse me. Wednesdays or Thursdays. I almost wrote a blog that, read, that said, you're worth more than that. You're worth way more than that. And it was to young ladies who have bought this lie, who have bought some romance novel regarding love. 
and they think giving themselves up in, 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 in uh, um, sacrificing their own virtue even is love. That just because some asshole... Some jackass? Can I say that? Wow, that almost came out. <laughs> beep, beep. Where's the beeper? Hey, hey, where's the, I'm like, is that the beeper, right? Todd's like, oh, it's going off. It's a light back there. <laughs> I don't know what to do. DJ, make it happen. You're the AV leader. <laughs> I almost wrote this blog this morning. You're worth way more than that. Hollywood lies all the time. The only thing you're worth is your body. So why not let it all hang out? The only thing you're worth is what you can whatever for a, some jackass. You're worth way more than that. It's all a big lie. Romantic love in Hollywood is a big fat lie meant to ensnare you, to trap you. And, and, and scar you before you even know any better. That's the painful reality. How did I get on that? Does it matter? Not really. Not really. But there is peace in obeying God. Not Hollywood. Not media not following after the people who have no peace. Why do you think these actors are always drugging out and committing suicide and they're on like marriage number 48 and they make a mockery of God's institutions, their, their kids despise them, it's a complete train wreck. And you're going to follow that? You're going to follow the advice of a person who doesn't even want to be themselves 12, 18 hours a day? This is what you're going to take your love potion from? No wonder so many young ladies are absolutely miserable. I don't mean kind of miserable. I mean miserable. You know what it is? They don't like themselves. God said, I made you beautiful and perfect, wonderfully made just like that, and Hollywood tricked them. And then they, they, they're here, and they look back there and say, wait a minute. Something's not right here. I don't even like myself. I'm a woman, but I don't like women. It's, it's the worst. It's horrible. And it happens with men, too. It's horrible. And there's no peace. Five minutes. Why? Nobody's obeying God anymore. God's not in the house. How the heck would a kid even obey peace? The, the, for the... The father and the mother don't even care how the young girl's going out. Her skirt's letting her butt hang out the rear end, and she's walking out the front door, and nobody says anything. Oh, you look sweet tonight, honey. What the hell is wrong with people? Because there's no obedience. There's no, what are they going to obey? <laughs> this isn't, this is, they would be lucky if there's even one of these in the house. And if it is, it's probably in the attic. That's what this, this is the connective tissue. That's why nobody has peace. These poor girls, I always choke thinking about it. I don't know what my, I don't know. I just feel bad for girls for some reason. I mean, guys, whatever. Sucking up, you pansies. <laughs> I feel like punching them. No, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, mm, stop being ridiculous, right? But girl, I don't know. It just feels like, I don't know. Somebody's got to protect them. And nobody's protecting them. Their own parents aren't protecting them. Anyways, I digressed way over our time limit, so forgive me. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening and the truth that you've given us to contemplate as individuals as well as a family. Thank you for protecting us with the Word of God. We just ask for your blessings as we take what we've learned out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.